May Jesus and Mary be loved by all hearts. Blessed Paschal Tide on this Easter Sunday of 2023. Here is a 10 second clip from a lovely Marian Easter hymn, Regina Chaley, You Belong. I'm shooting this little fireside chat with my Android phone. It's a lovely spring day, so we don't need a fire, but it's the best backdrop available here at my temporary residence as the guest of a Theotokin. Easter is an interesting feast. Liturgically, it's supposed to be more joyful than Christmas. We have lots more Alleluia's, but nobody exchanges gifts and few Catholics send out Easter cards. The great liturgy of the Easter Vigil captures well the darkness that almost permeates Easter. Jesus' followers were still dealing with the shocking brutality of Good Friday. All of the apostles had shamefully run away when he was arrested. They had time to call together the Palm Sunday crowd to put up a loud protest to stop the Sanhedrin, but they were too confused because they couldn't understand how a Messiah would submit to arrest at all. Then Jesus rises from the dead in a closed tomb with no witnesses until after he starts walking around. At the end of the day, he finally appears to the 12, and it's not trumpets and alleluias, but stunned surprise and even a level of disbelief. This Easter, we have the light of Christ, but the world still feels pretty dark. Do you feel like blowing trumpets and singing Alleluia? There is a lot of anxiety in 2023. The economy is hanging by a thread. Threats of war are being thrown around. There is civil unrest in many nations, as if countries are becoming unglued over many issues that weren't even issues a few years ago. I read a fun fact that the phrase, fear not, occurs 365 times in the Old and New Testaments. The Holy Trinity is reminding us every day of the year that we have no need to be anxious and afraid. We can certainly feel afraid, but trust and courage are the virtues that God wants us to, to see in us. If we are doing our best to live in a state of grace, then we are in the arms of God, whether our body breathes its last today, next year, or in the next century. We'll be getting a new body, thank God. That's what we're celebrating today and for the next 50 days until Pentecost. If you've seen some World War II movies, then understand that spiritually we are actively in combat right now. During that war, no soldier knew how long the war would last and when he could go home or whether he would make it home. You are a soldier right now. If you consecrated yourself to Mary, then you weren't simply drafted through baptism. No, we enlisted. We understood the threat coming at us from the demons and the people under their control. And we cared enough about the honor of the crown to sign up for the fight. The crown isn't a very democratic or American phrase, but the church is a monarchy and her members are all royalty. The new Adam and the new Eve are the sovereign king and queen of this earthly realm. If you are watching this video right now, you are not just a soldier, but expected to be a leader. You have to rally the troops around you, your spouse, your grandkids, your neighbors, even strangers who might approach you at the grocery store because they notice that you are wearing a cross or a blessed medal, and they are grasping for hope from anyone who has some faith. Combat books give advice to leaders, and I'm going to give you three points in this video to keep reminding yourself as a leader. Number one, at all times, leaders must exude confidence. If leaders show uncertainty, then discouragement spreads like wildfire, and people who could be helping the cause disappear into the trees. Why did soldiers rally around General Patton? Because he never took cover. He never showed fear. There were stories that he'd be eating in a flimsy hut, and when an air raid would start, he didn't run for shelter. Instead, he made table jokes that the Germans didn't have the talent or the ammunition to penetrate that hut. The men would laugh, relax, and no one left the table. 
On at least one Sunday, hundreds were in an open field as a priest was celebrating Mass. Catholics were kneeling, and many non-Catholics stood in respectful attention. I think it was a consecration going on. Suddenly, there was a fierce air raid. The priest couldn't leave the altar. When he turned around and looked up, all the men had run for shelter, except General Patton, who was standing there respectfully in the middle of the field. Patton had many faults, but he was a perfect leader, and the Germans feared him more than any general. What is our basis for confidence? We've been promised ultimate victory through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Sure, we're going to lose some battles, but we'll win the war. You must wear a smile. No furrowed, worried brows. No complaining. We're not directly under the general. Maybe we're a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, a captain, or even a colonel. But the reality is that we're all in a chain of command, and we might not admire the human leaders who directly outrank us. I'm talking in metaphors. I'm referring to leaders in church and state. If God allows us to have flawed leaders right now, it's because we have not merited to have holy leaders. So we have to suck it up as penance and keep marching. We know the right direction, even if leaders get confused. So, number one, exude confidence. Number two, stick to the plan. Our general right now is the queen of heaven. This is her war. Jesus descended into hell and set us free from the bondage of sin that Adam, the head of the human race, had contracted with the devil. Jesus broke that contract, then opened the gates of heaven for anyone who accepts him as Lord. The new Eve is leading the present war, not to win heaven, but to claim the earth as God's dominion. Her objective is to free the earth of the dominion of her arch enemy and his followers. Scripture will be fulfilled that the meek will inherit the land. Yes, her victory will end in expelling the demons completely. Numbers don't matter. We are in the light. Our enemies have darkened souls and also darkened intellects. They make stupid mistakes, and they often quarrel among themselves. Our primary advantage is knowledge of the plan. Even in plain view, they don't understand it. It's not in code. If we understand the plan, we can work with the queen who has the counsel of the Holy Trinity and a legion of holy angels. For 25 years, Our Lady has rolled it out, piece by piece, through her humble priest, Stefano Gobi. For 25 years, he traveled the earth and held prayer cynicals in which hundreds of thousands pledged allegiance to her immaculate heart and offered her obedience and sacrifice and prayers. Many have passed on to their eternal reward, but all that ammunition they merited is stockpiled for us. We just have to have confidence in its efficacy and use it. The Marian Movement Blue Book is the blueprint, the map to victory. I read a portion every day in Carmel for more than 20 years. It's like the Bible, very deep, an endless well to draw inspiration from. And now you can listen to it over and over while you're driving or doing housework. Theotokens have made it possible for me to upload audio readings of 23 out of 25 years of messages. The last two years are in progress and coming soon. Also, I recorded 14 one-hour videos on the apocalypse to unpack what Mary told Father Gobi about us living now in the book of Revelation. Also, I recorded a couple dozen talks on her approved apparitions, which add more nuances to the main plan. It's knowledge of that blueprint that also allows you to test the new prophets who show up on the internet or in bookstores claiming to have revelations with more details from Mary regarding our times. If these so-called Prophets deviate from that blueprint. They are false prophets. Are they telling you to be afraid, to hide in a refuge, to rejoice because this whole battle will be quick and easy and painless for those who say this or that prayer? That's not her blueprint. If you follow those people, you'll end up in a foxhole and a grenade is going to drop in and land on your head. Number one, exude confidence to your troops. Number two, stick to the general's plan. Number three, be flexible. 
The plan is in stone, but some things are, not out, are only outlined and will be fleshed out later on. Yahweh gave the blueprint to Israel through the prophets of the Old Testament so that they could recognize and welcome the Christ. And some prophets never got official recognition, so there were some private revelations that were also floating around like, quote, he will be called a Nazarene, which Matthew cites. It's not in the Old Testament. The timing was very clear from the book of Daniel. Israelites were willing to accept John the Baptist and several others who seemed to be Messiah candidates. But when it came to Jesus, too many were inflexible in their interpretation of some of these prophecies. They took it too literally that the Messiah would set them free. They took it too literally that he would reign as the son of David. They missed the carpenter who rode a donkey and not a war horse. Many today are so busy following prophets who have very literal interpretations of what Mary has prophesied that they are going to fail to recognize the anti-Messiah, the anti-Christ. Instead of working for the Queen of Heaven, they'll be captured by her enemies. And you too, if you tie yourself tightly to these prophets. Flexibility also involves a willingness to adjust our tactics and weapons. Situations change. Something may have worked for a while, but be flexible. Keep looking for ways to be more effective. I got a fresh lesson on that a few days ago on Good Friday. As you know, I haven't uploaded videos in quite a while because it was a conscious decision to work on other projects, especially the French translations and the website. But I have lots of topics in mind and was wanting to share information with you and some encouragement. My former videographer was in town for several days last week, so we took advantage of the occasion to shoot several videos. We ran into the usual challenges with equipment. There was a dead battery, and then a dead microphone, and finally we identified a dead cable. We spent hours doing research and shopping, and finally after a couple days work, we thought we had produced several good videos. On Good Friday, I had a long morning because the liturgy was in the afternoon. I began to edit those videos. About 10 minutes in, and this happened every video, the frames and sound began to slow down and my words became blub, blub, blub. The picture was good. It was slowing too though. So it seems to be a power problem inside my camera. Probably another battery issue. It's impossible to know some problems are happening until you load the completed video into editing software. Before the frame slowed down, however, I wasn't pleased with our new microphone. It wasn't a cheap one. Maybe the position was too close to my clothing. These things take many experiments to get right. We tried shooting one of those videos with my Android phone with a little tripod that we bought to test out the quality. When I went to edit that one on Good Friday, the sound had an echo effect because the phone was on a tripod in the center of the room. That's why right now I'm using a headset with the phone and I'm up close to the screen and I'm hoping that the microphone close to my mouth right here will give a better sound. I had the opportunity to it. Actually, we don't want all sound. There's some sound coming down the chimney right now because there's some wind going on outside. I had the opportunity to attend a Tridentine Good Friday liturgy that afternoon, but I forgot to bring a missile. So I was listening to several hours of Latin without the benefit of an English translation. As a result, I began talking to God, asking him to help me understand the failure of all these videos. Hours and hours of time which went down a drain. Lord, what are you telling me? Should I invest in more expensive equipment? Should I forget videos for a while? Was he displeased with any of the topics? Was it just a sacrifice required because we're in a battle that requires a lot of sacrifices? I kept asking questions, but no answers were coming. The Good Friday service basically culminates in the reception of the Eucharist. Suddenly, after Holy Communion, the answer was very clear in my mind. It used to be easy to make videos. I have an excellent microphone that plugs into my computer. I used to read the transcript from my computer screen while talking into the microphone with audio software running. 
No picture is involved. I can edit the audio with precision, which I can't do on my movie editors. So I turn an audio recording into a YouTube to make a movie by putting some religious art on the screen. Voila, easy. All the trouble begins in the effort to get my face on the screen. Two main reasons led me to get in front of a camera. Number one, I wanted to offer some opinions on certain topics and it seemed cowardly to talk behind a curtain. I wanted to be upfront with my audience. Number two, audio podcasting had been the internet norm for many years. But gradually, most of the talking heads were starting to do video podcasting and show their heads to the audience, which could feel like they are interacting. And that seemed like a good thing. But video recording was always a serious challenge for me. I don't have a convent yet. I'm a guest of different friends. I cannot set aside a room for a studio with a permanent backdrop and lights. You need a large room if you're using artificial light. Each time I've shot a video, it was necessary to find a suitable back wall and figure out the lighting and ask others in the house to please be quiet. Lighting is the hardest thing. Last week, we had perfect, indirect, natural light from an upstairs patio window. But during the fourth video, a bank of clouds rolled in, light, dark, light, dark. I was so distracted by the flashing that I almost stopped recording. I could only imagine how badly it was going to look for my viewers. So suddenly at the end of that beautiful Good Friday liturgy, peace filled my soul. The mission of exposing my face to the public was accomplished. People can look at past videos to see that I'm a real person who is serious and sincere about the topics I present. But the order of the mother of God isn't about Sister Anne. My face is not supposed to be identified with the order like Colonel Sanders chicken. It's Mary's order. And in the future, I'll fill the screen with her face, with religious artwork. I've loved stained glass windows from childhood as my favorite art medium. The people on the glass don't come to life until the light of heaven is shining through them. You're going to see a lot of stained glass henceforth because I often stop to take pictures of windows when I visit a church. I'm good with Photoshop and I can correct an angle and do a little patching up to make these homemade photos look pretty decent. When possible, I'll add the name of the church and the city to the picture in case you want to check it out in person when you're traveling. I welcome more pictures of stained glass windows as email gifts. Please take your phone and get it close to the window to get as high a resolution as possible. Zoom in. I don't want the wall and I don't need the window frame. If the light is shining in, stand to the side to avoid the glare. It will skew the picture, but that's easy to correct in Photoshop. My mailing address is on the website contact page. I mean, my email address, also my mailing address, which keeps changing. But the, the website is houseofmaryomd.org. I don't know how this phone video is going to turn out. Whatever the quality, I'll upload it. I'm not saying that this is the very last time you'll see my face talking on screen, but it won't be the norm henceforth. I will start uploading videos more frequently on a variety of topics, but they will basically be audio podcasts with pictures. So, happy Easter. Peace.